congestion pricing, and it's a regressive tax. It hurts the low earners that have to pay as much as a high roller. Uh, uh, McDonald's clerk or E3 pays as much as a lawyer, a doctor, or a colonel. And it, they really don't relieve congestion. They, they don't, don't even provide positive revenue. You're, you've had your own, your own consultants come up here and tell you that, your own consultants. Now, that Norfolk's had this congestion pricing for quite a while. BDOT wants to bring this to the peninsula. Uh, there was a public hearing on September 30th in Hampton, a very remote corner of Hampton. It was hard to find. It was very sparsely attended. And it had very vague literature. This literature here. It only talked about 13 miles of congestion price. They called it express lane. Nowhere in the literature they mentioned there was going to be coal. Nowhere in the literature that they mentioned that it's going to hook to a bigger connection. This is called Section 4A, 4B. They're there 
on your agenda later today. Nowhere does it say it's going to hook the 4C. If that's not going to happen for us, bridge tunnel, cross the bridge tunnel, over to Ward's Corner, and finally hook up the congestion pricing here. And eventually, there's going to be a whole loop all around this area. But, it, you know, you, you people all know this, but the general public doesn't know that. And this literature did not tell them that. And there was a five question sheet, and it's already asked it. It has questions like, how did you find out about this meeting? You know, you know, that's not public hearings. That's not telling the public what, you, what you're doing. And the funny part is, that's not even congested highway there. It doesn't get congested until it gets down to the bridge tunnel. And that's going to be fixed when we get this new David Gansey to put in. Unless you guys told them, or allowed me not to told them. You know, for, for eight years now, since 2014, We've been paying taxes to, to the Hampton Road Transportation Fund, and that's done a lot of good. It's good building the Hampton Road Bridge Tunnel extensions, the High Rise Bridge, the interstate uh, northeast, west of Jefferson Avenue, and a lot of other stuff is doing good. But when the General Assembly passed that tax, they put a thing in there that said that, that those funds should only be used to provide the greatest impact to reduce congestion to the greatest number of citizens of the area. And congestion pricing does not do that. Congestion pricing only makes a private lane for people that can afford it. Not, not for your, not for your, most of your constituents. And there's only one group that can stop that, and that's you people. This group sure, sir. Say you can stop congestion. Am I, am I yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, sir. We're now at the item number four, which is executive director report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my monthly uh, report is included in your agenda. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. I would like to highlight just a couple of items very quickly. First, one of the mentions that our regional transit advisory panel continues to meet. And in fact, in this room, almost 40 representatives of that panel convened this past Monday. Um, and they are really beginning to um, come down to a set of recommendations and preparing those recommendations to discuss with the regional transit agencies and also this HRTTO board. So uh, really looking forward to having them as a future agenda item for the board. And you should be able to look forward to that probably at your January HRTPO meeting. Um, William, your team has been fantastic partner on that, as has uh, Zach and the WADA team. We really appreciate your collaboration, Suffolk Transit as, as well. And I'm um, really excited about the, the conversations they're having and, and some of the ideas that, that, that they're going to bring forward. Uh, the second item, Mr. Chairman, and I just asked for your, your um, the opportunity to do this, is, is, a, is a bit of a sad announcement, um, but, but one that I, I feel is very important that, that we recognize today. Um, I'm going to uh, hopefully um, not put her in an uncomfortable position, but I'd like to ask Ms. Kendall Miller if she, she might say <laughs> So I think many of you know Kendall. Uh, Kendall has been with the HRTPO and PBC for just over 10 years now. Um, very sad to report. Um, I'm sad that I'm excited for Kendall. Um, but Kendall's last day with us will be November the 1st. Uh, Kendall will be moving on. You, you haven't heard the last of Kendall Miller. <laughs> She's going to be moving on to an incredibly exciting opportunity sure you all learn more about um, in, in the coming weeks. But I just wanted to pause and take a moment and talk about just the incredible contribution she's made to this organization, she's made to this regional community. Uh, you know, when Kendall came here in 2010, um, she really started from scratch all those of creating a regional public involvement program that not only included our community and region, the important work of this TPO board, but it incorporated things like civil rights consideration, environmental justice, public involvement, and in public discussion on important regional decisions and investments that this TPO board has made. Um, she single-handedly formed the uh, Community Advisory Committee, uh, which you all appoint membership to. 
that really provides the community's viewpoint on important regional transportation planning items. And I've got to say, and, it, and I'm, I'm going to quote Federal Highway Administration, her work with public involvement, Title VI, the Civil Rights, the Community Advisory Committee, is not only a model in Virginia, but they consider it a national model. And um, that's something um, she's worked very hard on. She's representing you all incredibly well. <coughs> Um, her, the respect um, of her community advisory committee for her work is, is unbelievable. When you go to the meetings and, and see the way that she engages with them and with the general public, it, it's just been a tremendous benefit. So, um, Mayor Tuck, I could go on for quite a while and not do justice as tremendous work this bill has done for us. Um, but, sir, I would ask if the TPO board can acknowledge your tremendous contributions with the Ron. Kendall, thank you so much. This is a goodbye. It's um, looking forward to working with you some more in, in, in the next chapter. So, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, sir. So I'm going to move on to item number five. Um, and um, wanted to uh, recognize one of our staff employees um, who's had a, a significant milestone with us this year. Um, I guess this is my day to put staff in an uncomfortable position. I'm going to ask Ms. Stell Smith if she might sit this out. So I, I think you all know Del. Um, she's our long-range transportation planner, our principal in charge of our regional planning program. Uh, Del has a number of hats that she wears, from doing GIS work, to doing travel demand modeling, and overseeing uh, those various functions. But a big part of Del's life is developing, obtaining, and maintaining our long-range transportation. Uh, through Dell's work and all the presentations you see her do, we're able as a region to identify regionally significant projects, to prioritize those projects, and send the priorities that they have the most congestion relief over to HR tax so those projects can be funded and move forward. Um, Dell um, has done tremendous work for us. I would hold our long-range transportation plan up against any transportation plan for any region in this uh, country. And um, Dell, I just want to take a moment. She's been with us 15 years now, and, um, uh, and we're hoping for 15 more, right? Dell, at least, right? So if you could please join me, thank you, Dell. Staff doesn't have to sweat. I think that's the last one. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Pardon me. I, I, I don't put you on the spot, Mr. West. I'm not sure if you've been here before. And so, are, are you new with respect to being here? It is West. Al Moore, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a Z scholar. I'm sitting in for Al Moore. Oh, okay, all right. I'm sorry. I'm just, yeah, okay. I apologize for welcome. Thanks for coming. Okay. Mayor, okay. take the apologies, Martin. I should have started. <laughs> Thank you for being here. It looks like West from here. It's a cause. All right. Here we go. Now, we're going to go to the item number six, which is the CTP update. Uh, <clears throat> we had a meeting. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, quite frankly, there wasn't much in the uh, planning stages for uh, this region. It seems that all the projects that uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Malden worked on previously are now well underway on the construction and on the way to completion. Uh, the only remaining thing left to do in a small part of our district is what's known as the gap, which is the uh, unfinished expansion of lanes on uh, Interstate 64 between what's it, Lightfoot and Bottoms Bridge is still is still in the works and that's about it for this reason. So if you have anything else? Mr. Mall would say Mr. Miller always has something to say, so I might as well just continue. 
Um, Mr. Stan's been a great addition, and he's already getting up to speed. It's like drinking for a fire hose. Uh, I told him that after his fourth year, he'll feel um, equally um, unintelligent about many things out there because there's just so much to know. Um, we did um, do, as Mr. Stan talked about, we also um, talked about the total revenue study that y'all are doing on the weekend traffic. And we're waiting on that to look at some uh, additional allocation. Um, it is an interesting thing. I ask you just to continue to think about it, given the speaker earlier this morning, that um, it's going to surprise some folks here, I would tell you, in our region, when we finish this out and we um, slap tolls on all these express lanes that we're doing, particularly the ones that are HOV now. Um, they're HOV about four hours a day, five days a week. Um, when I say it should be there, there are toll lanes otherwise open most of the time, and that's going to change, as you know, um, potentially. Um, and I just hope that we uh, do a good job of talking to our citizenry so that they understand all this is coming because it's coming and you're going to get some backlash, I can tell you. But you, you, you all will do what's in the best interest of the region and the folks. Thank you. I, I digress. The, the point is. We're waiting on that revenue study to look at the additional money that would come through some of the federal money um, before we would might allocate that to help close the gap of funding on HREL. And that would be uh, another Thank you. Thank you. Next, update. Thank you, Chris Hall. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of quick updates. Um, two projects I know folks are, are watching very closely. Um, our single three widening project on the peninsula, which will be finishing up here in December, I'll have that open the track. Uh, looking forward to that, as well as the work there, which got in the 64 264 interchange area, having that open the track by the end of the year as well. Just want to appreciate everybody's patience as we uh, work to the end. There's a lot of activity going on, there's a lot of lane closures and interruption of traffic, and uh, we appreciate everybody's patience on that as we as we work to close those projects out. Uh, the only other highlight that I have is you'll see uh, center stand center stand steel going up on the high rise bridge. That, that'll be in the December timeframe, so that'll be the next sort of big thing when we you know actually have a continuous span on the new bridge and uh, when it's going to be open next spring. So. Those are just a few highlights, sir, and uh, present questions that conclude mine. Thanks, DRPT update, Jennifer Tibble. Good morning. A few updates from DRPT. A couple on the study side. Uh, we are continuing work on our Virginia Transit Equity and Modernization Study. This was established by uh, House Joint Resolution 542 in the 2021 General Assembly session. Uh, we are we're nearing completion of our baseline conditions and opportunities assessment, uh, coming up on the deadline to submit our interim report to the General Assembly in early December. I uh, want to express our gratitude to our partners at HRT and WADA and Suffolk Transit for their full participation in that study. Uh, another study to mention is our 2022 statewide rail plan update. Uh, that process is also underway and we will be uh, working on expanded public involvement opportunities uh, with that beginning uh, shortly after the first of the year. A final update that I want to share is that from yesterday's CTB meeting, we're very pleased to present our first staff recommendations for funding under our new Transit Ridership Incentive Program. And this was established in the 2020 Transportation Omnibus Bill. Uh, we did uh, recommend funding for uh, one of the projects submitted by HRT, uh, and that is to provide funding to support operations of a naval-based circulator. And that funding recommendation is $2.4 million over the next three years. Virginia Port Authority update, Kathy Vick. Good morning. Nice to be with everyone. Um, you may have seen in the media a lot of congestion going on at ports around the country. I'm proud to say we're not one of them. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Senator Sproul, who's here, and the other legislators who had the vision to invest in us. Um, before all of this occurred. Um, but we're actually not only handling our 30% growth um, year over year volumes with 
fluidity and agility, but we're actually seeing more and more diversions from other ports on the East Coast, particularly for first in calls. Our new motto is move your cargo where your cargo will move. Um, and it's resonating loud and clear. Um, it has accelerated our need to start designing the NIT North modernization. Um, you probably remember um, when we modernized NIT South and increased the footprint there by 46%, we said in several years we'll probably need to do the same to NIT North. We're starting that design now um, and we'll likely have a request into the General Assembly um, to help fund that. So um, we're staying on top of it. The second segment of the deepening and widening of the harbor was also um, given a notice to proceed in late August because of the environmental windows. They'll actually put the dredges to work uh, after November 15th. But we're excited um, that both the east and west sides of the Thimble Shoal Channel will be complete by next August. We do have a new start and $83.7 million in the president's budget so that the district can um, let the contract for the Newport News deepening and the Inner Harbor deepening. So that will be the next segment. The district will do that, and then the port will concurrently let a contract uh, for the widening of the west side of the commercial <coughs> channel. So that um, project continues to make good progress. And again, with these first out calls shifting to Virginia, that certainly will help as that traffic continues um, to grow. The last thing that I wanted to mention is um, at Portsmouth Marine Terminal, now that we have the capacity at the two main container terminals, you all know that we have sort of emptied out Portsmouth Marine Terminal and had an eye towards making that um, the premier offshore wind hub on the East Coast. We have um, previously announced leases with Orsted, who is a global developer of offshore wind. They have eight contracts on the East Coast um, to develop projects, uh, mostly up in New England, and then Dominion Virginia Power. Also, we announced in August a uh, lease to them for uh, pre-assembly and loadout uh, for their project here in Virginia, which is the largest project on the East Coast. And I'm happy to um, tease you a little bit. You'll receive an invitation later today. The governor and the U.S. Secretary of Energy will be here Monday for a major announcement for a third tenant at Portsmouth Marine Terminal, who's actually an original equipment manufacturer. And it is the first step in really attracting the supply chain of the offshore wind industry here at Hampton Roads. So look for that invitation, and we hope to see you all at 10 a.m. on Monday with the governor and secretary of Energy. That's all for me today. Thanks, man. Thank you. Transit updates. HRT, William Harrell. Uh, good morning. Just a few brief updates. Uh, HRT has identified an initial recommended alternative of a light rail extension from Newtown Road Station to Centera Lee and the military circle redevelopment area. Uh, we see that as a very important potential project in terms of creating uh, an activity node on the eastern end of uh, light rail. We will begin an environmental assessment in January to clear this corridor. Under NEPA, we are working very closely with the city of Norfolk on this project. HRT remains committed to providing a high quality transit link to the rail station Norfolk. A future bus rapid transit project and corridor has been identified connecting military circle to the base. Uh, we're certainly appreciative of the RPT's uh, announcement uh, uh, in terms of providing the circulator on the base. That's clearly been an area uh, in terms of unlocking uh, the use of transit to the base. Once you get there, how do you get around? So that is a very critical issue for us. So thank you very much for your support in that regard. Finally, I'll say on the operational end, our biggest challenge is hiring bus operators. We're about 90 operators down out of 400 or so. So that's been a critical issue for us. Uh, we have reduced some of our service hours working with member cities, but we are beginning to see now an uptick in new hires. So we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to get up to full strength so that we can go back to full service and eventually expand uh, with the uh, additional funding from the families. Thank you very much.
Yeah, Wada from Zach Trotman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tuck. Um, bad news first, we share HRT's uh, sort of staffing challenges and certainly look forward to addressing them as we move forward. Um, <coughs> otherwise, we uh, have two facility projects we're really working hard on in this uh, environment. One is administration building, which is a tremendously big project for Wada, and it's something that we've been working on for many years, so that's progressing nicely to the design phase. Um, and then we also are on the cusp of uh, purchasing some property from another transfer station. So those two facilities will be nice, um, you know, nice for, for Wada to complete and sort of solidify our future. But uh, those are our biggest uh, activities right now. Thank you. CAC update, Jerry Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a few things to report because we've had two meetings since I last spoke. Um, we had to cancel a meeting in August for a schedule change, and so we met in September and October. We've been very busy. Um, and speaking of staffing challenges, I just have to say we've got a big challenge ahead in replacing Kendall because she is like at the heart of our organization, and she keeps us beating steadily. Um, so that's, that's tough for us to deal with. I'm going to start with our October meeting, um, and... We had a, a terrific presentation on the Virginia Coastal Resilience Master Plan that was given to us by um, retired Rear Admiral Ann Phillips. I'm not going to go into detail about it because there's too much to cover. It was an excellent presentation. I strongly suggest that anybody who hasn't heard her updates uh, tune in on the HRTPO board um, videos. And that way you can also see that all the questions that were generated, all the comments that were generated in our committee. It was just an amazing presentation. There was a real buzz afterwards. Um, then I'm gonna move on to September meeting. And that, I, I'd say that the, the highlight of that was the express lane update. And especially given the, the um, comment that was made earlier by the gentleman who had a public comment there were several concerns about that. One of the things that came up was um, the idea that they are, they are putting together a coordinated transportation management plan. And that is supposed to deal with the impact of having four projects at the same time going on around our region um, and how that's going to affect traffic. So there's this plan being as we speak, uh, worked on, and they are talking about mitigating traffic problems by doing things like encouraging people to take mass transit, um, encouraging people to double up in their cars or more, uh, encouraging people to come up with different schedules so that they aren't on the road all at the same time. And what came up as that was presented to us is, well, if you can do that for two years, why not start with that and see if you need to build all the extra road. And it, it just was, it was very striking, um, especially in light of a recently published uh, article that deals with a shift calculator that deals with um, induced vehicle miles traveled when you build something, which is, a, is another way of saying if you build it, they will come and that you start out with congestion being relieved, but in, within 10 years, you're right back to where you started and you have another expensive road building project in, in uh, your future. So it's, it was a very, this particular calculator was put together by a, a group of organizations and it's available on the T4 America blog, which is Transportation for America. It's an excellent piece of work. And I, I recommend that everybody look at it because it was something that we were really concerned about. It is going to be hellish um, for two years during this construction unless they come up with mitigation. And if again, if you can do it for two years, maybe longer term is a good idea. So anyway, thank you very much. That's that's it for me. So there's our military liaison updates. Uh, US Air Force call right now. Thank you, Mr. Uh, as a new guy here, um, or one of the new guys, uh, I'm the deputy commander uh, for uh, Joint Base Line in the Union of Houston. And so, in the first time in 25 years, I'm, I'm actually working for the Air Force. But I'll speak on matters for both the Air Force and the, uh, the new Army. 
Uh, first, I just want to thank you as we're just reading through what you guys are doing for, uh, for the region uh, in terms of our transportation and uh, uh, planning for the future. Um, if you're not aware, the Air Force is really examining uh, how it makes uh, investments in order to put additional mission growth. And that is tied to the region's housing, education, child care, and infrastructure. And with infrastructure, it is about transportation and about power. Uh, and both of those are, are near and dear. I just recently had a power outage uh, a couple of weeks ago that affected the entire installation. Um, but uh, transportation, obviously, is also very, very critical here. Uh, you guys also may have heard about uh, Defense Health Agency combining all of the, uh, the services. And so it's going to balance out uh, specialty care across the region. That really only works when there's a transportation network imagine uh, spouses and uh, those who are pregnant getting care and they're going to deliver and we have to go you know, through different areas here. Um, transportation is really kind of the, the limiting factor and we, we, we appreciate that and need support there. Uh, for Eustis, uh, I just wanted to just inform everybody that uh, it, it, we have three modes of uh, transportation out there. We have an airfield, uh, a port, as well as a railhead. We're making some additional investments there to do port dredging to expand our uh, operational uh, capacity, really supporting the Navy, really, uh, but also on, on the Army side. And so uh, we continue to put growth here and uh, we continue to go forward to partnering together so that we can uh, make this place a premier place for. Uh, for uh, our nation's military forces. Thank you. U.S. Coast Guard, Lieutenant Commander Ashley Holm. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Ashley Holm, the Chief of Waterways Management Division, uh, Coast Guard Sector, Virginia. Uh, so the Coast Guard has been uh, significantly involved with the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Expansion Project, um, specifically on the maritime safety side. So as of last month, we officially established six safety zones, and three of those zones are designated mooring areas and safe havens with all of the waterside equipment. And the remaining three essentially just keep vessel traffic out of heavy uh, construction zones, um, particularly around the North and South Island and the Little Bay Bridge. So that was a big win um, for us and, and the project. And I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Utterback with BDOT uh, for just a really a wonderful tour of the project site um, for our District 5 Admiral. It, it really informed her of just the scope uh, and the significance of the project. So thank you again for that. That's all I have. Thank you. U.S. Navy, Captain John Hewitt. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I may be new to this, uh, to this uh, panel. I'm not new to the area. About two months ago, I I uh, gave up command of Middle Air Station Oceana and, and now represent uh, Admiral Rock, the regional commander for Navy Region of Atlantic on this chief of staff, and uh, I have a lot of good friends in the room. Um, so thank you for having uh, me. Uh, we were very encouraged to hear uh, in the beginning of October of Gov Governor Northam uh, releasing $7.8 million in community uh, flood preparedness. Uh, grants, specifically the $900,000 uh, grant for the city of Norfolk for their coastal storm risk analysis, and $3 million to go to the uh, eastern branch of, of the Elizabeth River for uh, flood flooding and, and wetland restoration. Uh, we know that those uh, have a direct link to roadways getting access to our installations and then ultimately to our readiness. Uh, and from our perspective, that's what it's all about sure that we can get uh, our sailors to uh, to our bases so that we can uh, maintain the, uh, the tip of the sphere. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Airport Representative Michael Chorina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a few weeks back, we had the largest uh, private investment in the airport's history, uh, $15 million dollars. Uh, for a hangar, uh, most importantly, supporting and sustaining uh, 200 jobs at the airport with capacity for growth up to 400 jobs. Uh, so we're, we were grateful for that um, and grateful that the governor came down to uh, to help us do that. And uh, everyone else in the room that was there, we're grateful for your support. Uh, and 
During the summer, we uh, we won a federal grant, a uh, small community air service development grant for almost a million dollars to bring commercial air service to Newport News Williamsburg. Um, they targeted United Airlines. So we're in talks with United right now. And again, uh, our thanks, the commission's thanks to the community support because the community uh, offered up $600,000 to support that project. That's up to a $2 million revenue guarantee and advertising uh, project, uh, economic development project to bring United Airlines service to Dulles uh, to our community. So grateful for the community support on that. Um, we also hosted the State of the Region Address about two weeks ago. Uh, up to 400 people, I think, were there. The Virginia Peninsula Chamber of Commerce hosted uh, or, or uh, had the event. Um, so again, grateful for everyone's participation in that. We hope you got a good feeling and a good vibe at our airport and uh, understand that we are poised grow and support the community and I think it's all about jobs. Uh, if there's a demand, uh, speaking of, we have a huge demand for air service, uh, especially on the peninsula. By the way, we, we leak more passengers to Richmond than we do Norfolk. So my uh, colleague Robert Bowen, um, he can keep his traffic and we can keep our traffic and everybody would be happy in Hampton Roads. Um, <laughs> And uh, but we leak 91 percent of what could be our traffic to other airports, to include Norfolk, but uh, mainly to Richmond. And um, but our load factors are high. The airplanes are full. We had uh, overbooked flights over this weekend. Uh, I can report that to you. Uh, recruitment on my side, it, it's still I'm still uh, having an issue with the shadow. Uh, of the past, but we're, we're rounding the corner on that. I'm actually taking phone calls from airlines and uh, not the other way around. It's a tough go for them with COVID at the moment. Airlines are now scheduling six to eight weeks in advance and not six to eight months in advance. We don't get a final schedule until about six to eight weeks out. And that's true everywhere. So um, we suffer from that. And so it's, it, it's hard to plan when you don't know what else is coming down the pike. So, um, not just us, but for the airlines. But we are poised to grow and, and self sustain and no issues there. Uh, we at our airport are rebranding, and especially now we're going to target uh, homeowners uh, that are to have two homes, a second home somewhere. And we're also focused on the military, not just because I'm a, military, <laughs> a retired military guy, but we understand uh, the impact of the military on the region and we also understand that the military brings a whole lot of visitors uh, not just the official travel but uh, maybe grandma and grandpa coming to see uh, the kids uh, and, and so on and also getting members out on vacation and some leisure so we're targeting those lastly infrastructure infrastructure is a big deal our airport terminal is 30 years old and needs an upgrade and uh, we would we look forward to Washington uh, providing an infrastructure package. It's our understanding that there's $20 billion uh, slated for infrastructure, specifically terminal infrastructure at airports, and a bill should it ever be passed and come down. So we'll be aggressive in pursuing that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, now we have the FTAC chair. Uh, Good morning. To everybody, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm uh, I'm pretty actively involved with a variety of uh, organizations related to freight transportation in the area and since the first meeting. If I could give a little background, I'll move it along quickly. Um, but the uh, new FDAC chair, uh, I'm also uh, first vice president for the Tidewater and Motor Truck Association. Um, I'm also involved with the uh, Peer Committee, uh, which meets with the uh, Port of Virginia to do a continuous improvement uh, process uh, to smooth out operations at the, at the port on behalf of truckers. Um, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Port City Transportation, which has uh, intermodal trucking operations from York and down through Jacksonville. Um, so we do have a chance to compare uh, transportation networks around 
uh, parts of the Southeast United States. Um, for those not familiar with the HRTPO, since we have a few, um, uh, with the FTAC, excuse me, since uh, we have some new members here, uh, the FTAC was established in 2009 to provide the opportunity for the freight transportation industry to participate in and contribute to the regional transportation planning process. Um, we also have a role in informing the public about the importance of freight transportation issues um, throughout the region, and we also collect input from the public uh, on those matters. We meet quarterly or more frequently as needed. Um, recently, we provided some suggestions for the HRTPO project prioritization tool, and we also provided comments to uh, recommend 70 projects that have been included in the 2045 long range transportation plan that, uh, that you just went through earlier uh, this year. Uh, we also received briefings and provided comments to the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, the Economic Development Sites, in, uh, Economic Development Sites Inventory. We also provided comments on the Regional Connectors Study, uh, Smart Scale Projects, and the Scale Interchange Study. Uh, during our most recent meeting, which was in September, we received updates on the Federal Infrastructure Program and the Regional Legislative Agenda. And we also uh, made recommendations uh, to the Statewide Virginia Freight Advisory Committee uh, on the inclusion of two uh, new highway segments for the primary highway freight system in Hampton Roads. Uh, those two sections are the remainder of I-64 between Battlefield Boulevard and Bowers Hill, and the second section is on I-664 between Bowers Hill and Terminal Avenue. Uh, we also uh, made a recommendation that should additional mileage become available under the program, uh, that the Western Freeway from I-664 to the Virginia International Gateway Marine Terminal uh, also be included. The designation of these uh, corridors uh, makes it possible for uh, additional funding uh, to be applied to them. Uh, we continue to, to look forward to the opportunity to uh, share information with you about the challenges for the freight transportation system in the area. And I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. And thank you for those who are keeping track. We're now at item number 14, which is the election of the HRT to the board officer. And ask uh, Mr. Collins to present the HRT to the report on behalf of Chair Mayor Alexander. Yes, th thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman and board members, this is the meeting month when we um, nominate and elect the uh, officers for the HRTP board to serve for the next 12 months. Um, I'm going to provide this recommendation on behalf of nominating committee chair Mayor uh, Alexander. At the July meeting, Chair Tuck appointed members to the HRTPO nominating committee, which was tasked with bringing a recommendation for a slate of officers to the board for consideration to serve for the next year. The nominating committee submits the following individuals for your consideration. As Chair, uh, Mayor Donnie Tuck from the City of Hampton. As Vice Chair, Supervisor William McCarty from Isle of Wight County and his secretary, the HRTPO Executive Director. Um, what I would ask is, um, first, are, are there any other nominations from the floor for, for officers for the next calendar year? If there are not, um, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, to um, just, um, facilitate the proceedings, um, is there a motion to close nominations? So moved. Uh, motion by uh, Dr. Ward, second by Sorry. Mayor Dyer. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, on your behalf, um, since you're one of the candidates, um, if I if I may ask for a motion and a second to um, uh, approve the slate of nominations as submitted by the nominee. Okay. We have a motion by Dr. Ward, Sorry. second by Mayor Dyer. Any discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any, uh, any nays? Mayor Tuck, uh, Supervisor McCarty, congratulations. We look forward to working with you guys. Thank you so much. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're at item number 15, which is an HRBT expansion project report from Jim Otterback. 
Fantastic. Well, I, I think that it, it it's really a regional board meeting day that highlights the hand for restoration I know you're all using it, and everybody's excited about all the work you're seeing happening. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to welcome back Jim Utterback. Uh, he used to be at our table, uh, but uh, of course our project manager for the HRBT project. So Jim, thanks for providing us an update. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bob. Um, it's good to be here. So and. Uh, to give an update, it was a year ago, and uh, one thing Bob did say is uh, stay away from all that engineering jargon, mumbo jumbo. So keep it keep it simple and update to the board. Uh, I didn't get asked. We do have a project video. I did not show it. I think we're worried a little bit about technical um, stuff, but it is on our website, and it, it, it kind of drives through the project and shows exactly what's going to be built at the end of the day. So um, I will go through um, just a little overview on scope, schedule, and budget. And then we'll go through some of the shots. We've got a number of drone shots of what's going on right now. So where we started and where we are um, going going forward. Uh, project funding. Obviously, this is uh, this whole thing is enabled by the uh, HR TAC, so the transportation funds. So that has been a major uh, enabler for the project. You can see the smart scale money and VDOT uh, funds going to it. And I saw Kevin earlier. I didn't know if it was mentioned, but the uh, actually the mayor signed the uh, the, the loan documents for the uh, Tiffia loan, so they were able to secure a Tiffia loan for uh, HRBT again, another enabler to uh, get through this massive project. And then I think refinanced uh, uh, all the other uh, earlier projects. So successful, great effort by Kevin and uh, that team, and a number of individuals from uh, BDOT helped to uh, do that. So large team, large effort, and great, great news for. Uh, Great news for the region, great news for the project. So this is the uh, scopes. I've got a kind of a graphic there to, to help get us through. It's basically uh, 10 miles of uh, interstate improvements, so capacity uh, improvements going from just, uh, we're working with a termini on both ends of the project right now to accommodate the uh, additional HR EL uh, projects that are coming in. So we've moved the termini in Hampton to, the little white uh, hash marks, if you can see, uh, pointer or not. But anyway, the, the, the hash marks up here and uh, just under Hampton, uh, we've taken off basically three of those. So we've come back and, and starting just, uh, just uh, west of the Mallory Street Bridge. Okay, so uh, we, that is one of the five bridges that's being replaced. The other four bridges are uh, the Marine Trestles, so going across the harbor. So. This is a large uh, roadway project. It's also a large marine construction project. So it's a three and a half mile harbor crossing uh, with the trussel bridges, uh, island and uh, improvements or reclamation work, and then also the twin uh, tunnels that were boring. So under under the federal channel. So again, you can see the two north trestles, and I'll go into this in a little more uh, detail. Um, going to the island, uh, we've doubled the size of the North Island. That uh, work is very close to being complete, and we are um, uh, obviously adding on to the second, uh, the South Island, um, and then you'll have a large eight-lane trestle going from the uh, South Island to the uh, Norfolk Shore will be there. So coming across will be, uh, you'll hit uh, two more uh, marine trust actually three more so you've got the green are the trestles at willoughby this is a large structure we're adding one to that um, and then also bay avenue and oast creek so all all of those projects or those bridges i bring in because they were major components of the uh, permit that we obtained uh through the project so um again in the little yellow line you probably can't see our landside bridges so we have um 23 of those interstate bridges that will be uh, widened so, so again, a number of uh, structures being addressed so far. The uh, smallest structure has gotten the most publicity over in Hampton. So they fail very well on the uh, Mallory Street uh, bridge replacement. Next slide, this is the uh, schedule. So I just, I'll just walk through this very uh, quickly. We are, you know, bottom line, we are as of today still on the substantial completion date of September 1st, 2025, the final completion in November of 2025. That primarily will be geared toward uh, demolition, de demolishing existing marine trussel bridges. So substantial is all lanes open to traffic in both directions. So we walked through and for anybody who didn't know, a major aspect of this project was obtaining the permit, which was one of the largest permits. I think the Corps of Engineers 
had done in this area, and uh, we worked through it really in a kind of record time. So we have um, the permit was uh, precedent to uh, issue no notice to proceed. So you can see about four uh, four rows down. We got the uh, permits in September. The notice to proceed was actually a little bit after September, but in that time frame. So the contractor has been uh, working, and what I'll show you is basically the permit had to be obtained before you can start work. So everything you're going to see is really in the last year of what's been constructed. Um, so the uh, the big news, obviously, right now we've made a lot of uh, headway on the TBM. So that was uh, uh, built, uh, designed, manufactured in Germany, went through the factory acceptance test in the spring. It is currently being loaded onto um, uh, ships to come here. So uh, good news from Kathy Vick on the uh, port. So we have them underway in a couple of weeks and they all three vessels should be here by uh, November 21st um, and then we'll be working transit to putting the large components and assembling the TBM on the island, the South Island where we'll be launched from. So tunneling is scheduled to start in August right now, 2022 and uh, complete in uh, 2024. So that's a fairly aggressive schedule and I'll, I'll talk some more um, on that in a little bit. So project budget, again, I, I've got the uh, two, two tables there. One is the uh, overview of the whole, the whole project, and then the design bill contract is below. So we are uh, just under $4 billion on the project, so right at 3.9. So that's been a little bit of uh, change orders, and I'll talk about those, and also the option we exercise to rehabilitate the bridges. So expenditures, and this adds out as of September, so this is um, uh, $1.1 billion on the project we've been, been spending uh, this far. Now, I, I will go back just a minute. So I did skip over the very top thing. So again, about 30, 36% of the project time has, has elapsed. And overall, overall, including design, project management, and construction, they're at 31%. So there are some of the design that plan to be done earlier that's going to be a little bit late. And that is all of the internal works for the tunnel. So that that's not a concern, but it is running a little bit uh, later than originally projected. So, so back to the uh, funding. So the contract is set up. The original amount was three point two nine nine billion, just under the three point uh, three billion that we were um, holding to. Um, the net change orders right now is seventeen uh, million dollars in change orders. So there's about uh, fifty four change orders we've done. Twenty six of them have been. Um, have been uh, either have cost or scheduled impact. So 26 of these change orders have, have and um, just over 10 of them have uh, uh, credits back to the contract. So one of the ones we're negotiating right now is about $17 million credit back to back to the project. So um, two years into the project, two and a half years, we're gonna be net right around zero overall on change orders. There's a couple others that we'll have to negotiate based on the termini. So that'll go up and down, and we've got some work uh, right outside the uh, naval base that we're doing, uh, um, adding some uh, scope to address some concerns and working with the Navy on that. So um, overall, good news from that. The $73 million is the uh, um, option that was in the contract that was exercised, and this is rehabilitating the main side bridges, and that was a cooperation between uh, uh, VDOT and HR, HR PAC to work through the funding on that, and we got that uh, squared away and exercised that option. So again, on the contract, uh, they just over a billion dollars, so uh, remaining about 2.3. I'm going to go through the next couple of slides and just show kind of where we started and where we're at. I just want to say uh, one thing, and this is a, uh, for today, this is a good news, good news picture on this project. This is, a, a, you've heard a lot of people say this is the biggest VDOT project uh, VDOT's ever done. Um, it, I don't really focus on that as much as I do. This is probably one of the most complex projects we've ever done, with, without a doubt. And one of the things that really uh, makes this different than any other major project that you will hear or see, and even if you compare it to any of the roadway projects, it's all about getting, getting out of the foundation, getting out of the ground. Um, we will not be out of the ground and have control of our risks until 2024. So that's just the fact of the matter. When you're doing underground construction, you will be at risk until you can get through the underground construction. This is a major uh, marine crossing, major underground construction project. So 
just keep that in mind as we go forward. We don't know what we'll encounter. Uh, as a sidebar, we uh, dug up uh, seven, seven or ten cannonballs so far on the South Island. So uh, we ran into one uh, barge in, uh, when they were dredging for North Island. So it was determined to be historic. We've worked with THR on that. And of course, the, uh, the rumored uh, German submarines that were sunk over by Willoughby, which are not submarines, we, we have a contractor did uh, have his design with piles going through that, which did not work very well. So he's removing sections of that ship. It's not historic, but um, uh, certainly not something he had planned to do. So this is the land side. So just to orient everybody, this is uh, Mallory Street. So we're looking down from above. This is where we started. And uh, this is where we're at right now. So you can see this is looking at Mallory from uh, from the south side, looking north, and they have moved traffic over on the north side of the bridge and are uh, starting demo on the uh, on the south side. So a little bit more challenging again as they were looking at top down, taking that down. And this is uh, one of the older original interstate bridges when they started uh, uh, hoeing on the superstructure on one side of the bridge, concrete started falling off the bottom on the other side. So they have uh, stopped and regrouped. I think it was reported that we had closed the interstate last night. It was not closed. So they're still working through their uh, means and methods on how to safely uh, remove that bridge and start through that construction. So this is the North Marine Trestle. So you can see the um, existing uh, in the background and then what we're we're building is in the forefront. So there's two existing uh, two lane trestles out there and at the end there will be um, two four lane trestles. And you can see obviously where it's hooking to the island um, and the expansion of the island as well. So kind of a scattershot of photos there. So the um, upper left is uh, right at uh, Hampton. So the Strawberry Bank. So there's obviously because of the shallow water that constructed the temporary work trussel that comes essentially right up to the land. So that's where they're um, driving the piles um, on the uh, on the new trussel. So they can only get uh, about two lanes uh, wide on the on the new bridge, and then they have to move traffic and demolish the existing bridge. So uh, 2022 will be a um, big year of um, temporary maintenance of traffic shifts as we move people around to build a new structure and uh, uh, start demolishing the, the um, old structures. The uh, picture bottom right is the pile driving um, activity. So they have on the North Trestle gotten a number of the piles. You can see the basically the alignment of the bridge as it comes to the new island. Uh, this particular picture has two ringer cranes. The, the ringers are some of the bigger cranes in the world. This project has four ringer cranes on it, which is quite unusual. Uh, for uh, any, any project, and certainly on a project of this magnitude. Um, the lower uh, left here is the milestone cap. So that was that was the first one was set uh, about six weeks ago. They've set a couple more and they're working through that. So uh, this is a kind of a key step in getting the caps on. Those are being uh, uh, precast here in uh, Chesapeake, at the yard in Chesapeake. Um, so that's the next major move, and then you'll see the beam girders going in uh, very soon. Okay, North Island. This is, uh, again, keep in mind, this is what we've done in a year. So getting to the water, this is a reclamation that essentially doubles the size and, and um, uh, elongates it. So some of it's bringing it, bringing it back, and, and the machine will actually start on the South Island, and it will come up and turn on the turntable. Um, on the North Island. I'll be able to show you that here in a second. So you can see the quantities um, from, from that standpoint uh, with the Armistone, Bun Rock, and just, and by, all of this was brought in. There's no, none of the stones in Hampton Roads. Obviously, everybody knows that. So most of it came out of, uh, I think, Oregon, Hammer, and Grace, Maryland. So it was barged in um, for the town. And that's what it looks like right now. So it's hard to see from the road. So this is a pretty good shot. Um, and they've got all of the um, all the infield in. So the bun rock is they're still putting the larger armor stone around. That's the big crane, uh, the white crane with the little red peak. So if you actually can follow that picture um, in the background is there's some sheep pile walls and makes a little bit of a circle. That is where the um, tunnel will start. OK, so it'll come out of there. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. So here's where it will come out and turn around. So this is a little bit wider. It is a tight turn, but they turn. It turns on the turntable 
uh, very similar to the uh, what was done in Port of Miami for the twin uh, tunnels there. Um, so that's in that area. So we'll be underground all through here. This right now, this is all concrete. So there's a concrete slab there, and the uh, subcontractor is demobilizing from South Island and coming to uh, uh, North Island right now. So he's setting up. So this picture is a couple weeks old. All of that is uh, concreted in uh, for now. They should have the um, there is sand fill, and then there's a CB21 kind of a uh, a rock fill as well. They're this far in this picture, they're down past here. So uh, bringing it up uh, initially um, to uh, plus five with the sand and plus 11 elevation with the um, with the rock fill in. So that is that. This is the South Island. Oops, I double clicked there. So anyway, that's the existing picture of the South Island. This is what we're doing. This is um, um, this is a shaft or launching pit on the South Island. It's, it's good to figure. Sorry, Bob. This is a kind of engineering thing. <laughs> so this is uh, what what is unique about this is we refer to that as a tricell or peanut. It is kind of the more technical term is a caterpillar. <laughs> so it's done. At, I'm not aware of it being done in the United States, but it is done around the world for some of these uh, deep shaft excavations, and it's really for stability. Um, these. These are a series of slurry walls that go down uh, almost 190 feet, and it uses cutoff walls to try to keep the water out of the um, out of the uh, uh, watching pit, if you will. So this is under construction. They have, um, and I'll show you that in a second. Obviously, the approach, and I will point this out because the, um, you probably have seen some of the construction in the middle here. Um, with we have a crane in there building a ter temporary um, maintenance of traffic. So this is really going to be one of the more complicated pieces of the job. So it is extending off the South Island. This is a deep uh, hole here. So um, there's a lot of fill and a lot of activity in getting the structure out. So we have, we're going to have to move this uh, existing bridge over, put people on a to traffic uh, MOT uh, bridge, and uh, so we can construct that part of the project. Uh, very complicated, be very um, close to traffic as we work through that. Um, so that work is going on right now. So the team that actually is uh, rec working reclamation, North Island, will be moving over here when they finish and we get the, uh, the structure. So let me get the uh, next one. So again, that's what we uh, started with. And uh, the, the asphalt was all new. We had it right at the end of the project. That was part of the bird measures and trying to limit the migratory birds on the island. And uh, here's where we're at right now. So a lot of folks have been out here. It is. Um, an active uh, construction site, but I can point a couple things out to you. So all of the um, slurry panels are in to this tricell. You can see it right here. Around the top here is a capping beam. So we're pouring a capping beam right now to hold all of the panels together as you uh, before you can excavate the pit. So mass excavation is planned to start uh, around the middle of November. So we're working through um, this. There's a significant. Oops. Significant amount of steel, and uh, uh, actually struggled with getting that going in a productive. So a little bit behind on that work, but hoping to make it up. The other thing I'll point out is um, this is uh, the TBM quay. This is significant um, because this is where they will bring in all of the liner segments, uh, that which will be actually be the tunnel. And I'll show you a picture of those. They're coming from Cape Charles. So the 21,000 liner segments will be barged in. They'll um, they'll be. Um, There'll be the ability to, to stage some of them here on the island and keep a supply just because um, the uh, marine traffic in the 25 mile push is to make sure um, they have supply in case something happens and the port's closed for weather, what have you. Because once the machine starts excavating, it's not a good idea to let it um, um, stop, particularly in soft soil. Um, the other thing I'll point out is this is a conveyor, and this has advanced quite a bit. The superstructure is complete on that, and that is to take the uh, waste or muck off the island. So that'll what comes out of the, um, the machine will go be treated with a slurry treatment plant that was um, actually constructed in France. And so that is also going to be shipped over, but that will treat the water and bring out the solids, and that will go out and be uh, shipped to a, a facility off-site. They're hoping to get that ready in time to go ahead and ship the um, excavated material out of here. You got to remember this uh, This cell is about a football field long and uh, it's going to be excavated seven feet down. 
think that's the highlight. These were uh, barges. You've heard a lot about the migratory birds. These barges actually worked uh, very well for the birds and Fort Bull itself. So I think that's been a good uh, a good effort for uh, the team and working with the uh, appropriate environmental folks to try to minimize impacts. Okay, South Marine Trussels. Again, this is another uh, big, big change. It's, it's the big plus is once we get the temporary around the island, all, all of this existing and uh, what we plan to build. So it's one eight lane structure, it's 147 feet wide, so basically half a football field um, wide, and it's gonna carry four lanes in each direction as you come out. And again, you can see what the impact here is in getting that done um, from that standpoint. I will point out the uh, quantities are just uh, tremendous. So the 54 inch piles that you see um, right now, um, there's a thousand of them playing on a project. They hit a milestone uh, last week with 300 piles, so almost a pile a day, and they didn't really get started right when they had construction notice to proceed. So you can see there's a number of uh, square piles, uh, a large number of caps. So they're just getting going on the, the caps, the girders. Uh, we're expecting them to bring in some type of, uh, it's a similar but not the same um, a beam launcher that they're using on Rodanthe Bridge right now. If you've been down there for the construction, uh, Flatiron is the prime contractor on that. Flatiron is uh, heavily involved, kind of leading this effort for the Marine Bridges here. So a number of folks from around the country um, in on that and they, as they try to figure out how to uh, get through that uh, construction phase. And I think that's coming in fairly good. You can see um, where we've gotten into open water and production has gotten much better now as they're getting the full set of piles coming across. So it's eight, eight for each bent as they come around um, from that standpoint. This is the um, um, area at the end, again, at Tynan Willoughby. There is uh, obviously work trusses there because of the shallow water. And uh, you can um, guess what the gap is. That's where, our, <laughs> that's where our sunken ship is. So they were moving that in sections right now and should be able to go back and, and get that, that area closed in. Um, landside, so we, we come across Willoughby Spit. And again, people don't probably, I mean, the, the piles are visible, and I should point that out um, because that is a big deal, especially um, around my house. Uh, resiliency is a big deal, and these bridges are going to be uh, six to eight feet higher than existing bridges. They also, you see their angle, so there is uh, super elevation. So it is turning back. Existing bridges are uh, literally flat, so these were designed and built, and you know, the uh, 50s and 70s, so we do have a super elevation coming around. So some of that is you can see by the things as it comes through the turn. So, uh, but I did want to point out those are raised that this is the same size because we are adding on. So right now, uh, contractors done a lot of work here. This picture is a little bit old. You can't see any of this from the road. I don't think you can see the the pile driver, but they have placed I think three caps so far. So they've got the caps on there, and they're working on the next thing. So the just so everybody knows, um, what we will be, you know, they're going to try to construct this bridge and they're still trying to determine whether they can we need to work with the Navy easement to be able to get into that end to construct from the water or they'll move traffic onto the uh, eastbound bridge and, 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 and then widen the west, uh, westbound bridge. So they're still looking at two options on that. Uh, you can see again, this is. Sorry about that, got a sheet on there. That's, that's how we're adding on to the bridges. This is a new structure. We're going through that. Um, okay, and then the, the next couple of slides is I'm getting uh, closer to the end. So the um, uh, this is the uh, land side work at both um, Oast Creek. So there were, I think they've st we started setting caps there as well. So they're driven the piles and setting the caps there. And then, um, oops, I didn't, did I go past two of them? No, that's it. That's it. So there is, uh, we also have the Bay Avenue work board as well. Um, so this is the, uh, what I call the tunnel construction. So this is the actual tunnel. So when the TBM goes through, um, it does place these rings um, as part of the system. And we, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, we've got a lot of videos and things online at the project site. So uh, good news, this is actually being uh, um, constructed in, uh, at the uh, concrete plant over Cape Charles. Uh, so there's a subcontractor in there, uh, Technocrep's done a lot of work with Vinci around the world. So they are leading the effort. Um, these molds came from France. So you can see these, all of them came in, all of them work. They're set up. This is a mock-up. There's actually two rings 
Uh, they run a test, so I think mean, 58, a precision survey of it, uh, 58 points, and one of the points was out of tolerance by 0.6 of a millimeter, so uh, which is uh, incredible. Uh, and also, these things are sitting on their side, which they won't be in the tunnel. The ring will be up and will be fitting together. So that uh, was certainly not a concern. So that production is scheduled to start here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and it's a little bit of a, a note. This, you all are obviously, as, as Kathy mentioned, and worldwide, the um, uh, supply chain uh, things messed up. So they, they would have started, but they did not have the uh, size uh, steel bars that they needed. So otherwise, we've been under, under production right now. Um, they have redesigned for another size bar. Those bars are coming in. And so they should start in the next couple of weeks. So it's really this availability of steel is a is a, um, it's a big challenge on the project right now. But they were able to work around design um, on this particular issue, and they're looking at some design changes on some of the others to try to get ahead of the, um, the curve on that. This is the machine itself, and we've had a lot of publicity on that. I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time at this presentation. We've got a lot on the website, and we can we can talk about that a lot. It's a, it's a tremendous machine. So it's the largest slurry machine in the world. Uh, we've got two tunnel firms on the contract. Uh, Dragatis is known for large tunnels, primarily EPB machines. Uh, NC is known for large slurry machines. So between the two, this is a slurry machine, but it does, it's, it's considered variable density, which is actually on the side. So it has the screw of components you'd have on pressure balancing. A couple things about it, just so you know, the, um, the geotechnical profile is, a little bit different than uh, Thimble Shoals uh, project, so it was uh, actually more difficult, and so the contractor decided on the sort of machine. The pluses on that is the material coming out of it is treated a little bit different, so it's actually a little more environmental friendly. And the second thing is with this machine, they're available. They're able to do intervention, so if they go in and, and cut these, um, these are cutter tools, that they, and they will get damaged. They can do these in free air, and not hyperbaric intervention. So it's a, it's a state-of-the-art machine, um, and we're, we're glad it made it through factory acceptance testing and should be showing up in uh, November 12th for the first U.S. flag shift. So question here. So um, the uh, team was quite uh, innovative in their painting scheme. So can anybody figure out the painting scheme? <laughs> <laughs> so the colors um, are obviously the HRPC, so in the uh, Chamber of Commerce colors. So there are also, with the cutter disc, there are 14 of these stars, which uh, actually coincide with the localities. And uh, even more bizarre is six of them are on the uh, peninsula and eight of them on the south side. So it doesn't get any better than that, right? This machine was made for you guys. <laughs> Any questions, comments, uh, observations? Well, thank you again. First time I've never had questions. <laughs> If I may just very quickly, and I'd be remiss, and I see Kevin Page in the back there, that keeping in mind HR TAP, the 14 stars are the HR TAP 14 other localities uh, that all, all participate in the information. Thanks for coming. But um, Jim, thank you. Kevin, thank you. I know you and Jim work side by side a lot on this. But, um, we just think you know this is just a tremendous, tremendous example of regional collaboration and really getting something transformational for this region. So uh, we'll continue to work with Jim to keep it updated as the project is going. Well, I was looking for Kathy Vick to see if there's an invitation for the winner, what, 21st to come out and see the arrival? Where's the next call? 12 o'clock, so expect the invitation. Yes, you have to speak for him. Um, yes, so uh, yes, we're very excited. You know that date has shifted and, uh, and, and uh, we'll keep you posted on the November 12th. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Uh, that said, uh, we're at agenda item number 16, which is the FY 2021 audit financial statement.
Yes, our uh, auditor, uh, Mr. Keith Bears, uh, Mr. Michael Garber, will be giving this report to the board members. I don't know who I made mad to have to go after that presentation. <laughs> but now I know what it feels like to be the presenter right after lunch. <laughs> because that was exciting, and this is not going to be that exciting. I apologize. I apologize in advance for that. <clears throat> Um, and, and my presentation will be short, and that's a good thing when your auditor is giving a short presentation. Um, you don't want me standing up here going through a whole lot of details of, of things that we may or may not have uncovered, which we did not. So um, with that, uh, I know that we have finished our audit um, of the Planning District Commission last week, and of course the TPO is part of those financial statements. And so obviously we have finished then um, the audit for the TPO as well. Um, with that, just briefly, I think everyone has received this document ahead of time, maybe an email in electronic form. I just want to say the opinion on the financial statements themselves is an unmodified opinion. That's a clean opinion. That's the one that we're all looking for. So we had no audit adjustments. Um, we had no past adjustments. Working with um, Sheila and the finance team and management, all of our questions were answered. All the documents that we wanted to look at. Um, were provided inquiries and things like that, so it went extremely well. Um, we had no findings as far as internal controls. We have no um, suggestions there on things to change. We had no compliance findings. Um, there was a single audit that was performed as well for all the federal dollars that flowed through the entity, and we had no findings with the federal dollars that we looked at in there as well. So a clean opinion, a cleaner report um, for, for both the planning district and the TPO. And with that, I really don't have anything else to, to go over, and that's a good thing. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about the audit. And, and, and I, would, I will add that I'm excited to watch the project as a new homeowner in the Virginia Beach area. Um, I, I still live in beautiful Shenandoah Valley, but uh, have some property down here now. I'm a taxpayer, and I'm looking forward to having these, these projects finished. It helps me that four-hour commute. Dilly, dilly, and welcome. <laughs> I knew something was coming to that point. <laughs> Any questions or comments related to the audit? Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And thank you to the HR, PDC, HR, TPO staff for uh, having an excellent audit. Now, we need to ask for a motion and a second to approve the audit financial statements as presented. So second. Motion second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? I say aye. Aye. Opposed is nay. Motion carries. Thank you. And then item number 17 is our regional legislative agenda, Mr. Crum. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. HR TPO board members, I'm pleased to present to you today our proposed regional legislative priorities. Uh, for the upcoming uh, 2022 General Assembly session. Uh, I will be asking for action at the conclusion of today's presentation from the board for, for approval of our legislative priorities for the HRTPO. A similar presentation will be provided to the HRPDC at their 1230 meeting today for the uh, endorsement of additional items that will be uh, endorsed by our Panthers Planning District. Uh, just very quickly, I'd like to review the process that we've utilized this year. Uh, for the first time this year, the TPO board and the PDC board uh, appointed a regional legislative committee. That regional legislative committee, uh, consisting of the chair and vice chair of the TPO, the chair and the vice chair of the HRPDC, and the chair and the vice chair of our chief administrative officer committee, uh, first convened on June 30th to begin discussing regional legislative priorities. You received the briefing here on some initial ideas on July 15th at your HR and TPO board. The PDC did the same thing that day. Our regional legislative committee met another time on September 23rd. Uh, they recommended a regional legislative agenda, which was shared with the CAO committee on October 6th, and we're pleased to be before you today. Uh, to present these items for your consideration. Included in your agenda was a paper that provided some background information on each of these items. I just want to run down through those very quickly. 
Uh, on transportation-related items, there are four items that we're asking the TPO board to create a, a regional statement and endorsement on for this year. First, um, thank you uh, to our CTB members for referencing this. Uh, but an important priority for our region continues to be the completion of the I-64 gap between Hampton Roads and Richmond. As was mentioned by our CTB members, there's about a 29-mile gap between where our improvements in Hampton Roads, uh, just west of Williamsburg, leave off our, our three segments of improvement for the I-64 Peninsula project. There's 29 miles uh, between that point and the Bottomsboro Bridge interchange near uh, Interstate 295 in Richmond. Uh, we were really pleased that the uh, CTB worked with the Richmond region to complete that section from 295 coming this way to Bottoms Bridge. Of the 29 miles that remains, 20 of those miles are outside of the Hampton Roads region. Uh, we really want to continue to request the support of our Commonwealth Transportation Board, Virginia Department of Transportation, of looking at opportunities to start completing sections of this gap. Uh, in working with VDOT, the estimated cost of the gap is somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 to $700 million. Uh, we are also very hopeful that the emerging federal infrastructure package might be an opportunity for us as well. And we want to keep uh, that priority at the forefront of, of our legislative agenda. These items are not in priority order, but I'll, I'll move on to the second one, the Elizabeth River Crossings Toll Agreement. Uh, this HRTPO board has taken a leadership role working with the Secretary of Transportation's office to convene conversations about what could be done to mitigate the impacts of the ERC toll agreement at the downtown and midtown tunnels. I think everybody's aware that's a long-term agreement. The tolls um, in, in the agreement, they escalate over time, and it's having uh, detrimental impacts to residents and businesses, particularly in our core cities of Portsmouth and Norfolk, but also, frankly, for, for the entire region. Uh, this board has appointed an ERC task force. Uh, we want to maintain this as an important regional, regional legislative priority. We think there are opportunities to work with the outgoing administration and the incoming administration to look at opportunities that might exist to mitigate the impacts of these tolls. Um, and, and your legislative committee recommends that this be maintained as a regional legislative priority. Thirdly, uh, improved passenger rail service. I, I want to thank Jennifer DeBrule and DRPT about the work that's being done. There's some great um, news coming to our region. Our next additional train to, to Norfolk is coming in the spring. Uh, the Newport News Ball and Bodal Center is making great progress, and another train that in fact will be coming to Newport News on the peninsula. Those are exciting um, areas of progress. In addition, uh, DRPT is working hard on some things on the mainline corridor, that I-95 corridor. Improvements between Richmond and Washington, D.C. are good for Hampton Roads because it's going to get us up to the nation's capital more efficiently and more quickly. But we all are aware that there are some congestion around that Richmond area. Uh, there are some challenges we have in terms of passenger service from Hampton Roads into Richmond, both on the peninsula and the south side. We really want to support any efforts, projects, policies, programs, and funding that improves not only the reliability, but the speed of that passenger rail service and continue to ride the great momentum that, that, that's occurred. So keeping our eye on improved passenger rail service between Hampton Roads and Richmond is our third legislative priority. And then finally, um, and I need to credit Mayor Tuck, our chair on this, for bringing this up to the Regional Legislative Committee. But, but I think everybody's aware that the gas tax is becoming a diminishing funding source for transportation. Um, as cars get more fuel efficient, um, uh, who would have thought, I, I can't believe what my Camry gets these days in terms of miles per gallon, as electric vehicles, as hybrid vehicles continue to expand within the market, expectations are the amount of gas that's purchased is going to be reduced. And it's just not going to be a reliable funding source as we look forward 10, 15, 20 years. Your legislative committee is requesting that we ask that alternative funding sources for transportation uh, be considered uh, by our General Assembly. Those are the four transportation priorities. 
I won't run down through the items that your PVC is going to discuss here at 1230, but just wanted you to see the uh, comprehensiveness of the regional legislative priorities that will be considered by the HR PVC uh, later today. Uh, together, they will be put together, if approved by this board um, and the PVC, the form our regional legislative package. Uh, we are hopeful for approval at today's meeting so we can begin to develop our brochures and our summary papers to be able to share with our Hampton Roads Caucus and General Assembly members. So, Mr. Chairman and HRTPO Board, the items that I would request your endorsement of are highlighted at the top of the list in blue. Again, they're the I-64 gap completion, mitigating the impact of the ERC toll agreement, improved passenger rail service between Hampton Roads and Richmond, in consideration of alternative funding sources for transportation. Sir, I would ask the board to consider uh, taking action uh, to approve those items today. Thank you. First of all, any question, Mr. Crump? Can I entertain a motion a second for approval of HRT through resolution 2021-05, endorsing our 2022 legislative priorities? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say Motion carries. Thank you. So we agenda item number 18, which is approval of consent items. Mr. Crump? Yes, your consent agenda items were included in your agenda distribution. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, we have one item uh, added is item 18-I. Uh, which delegates some responsibilities to your technical advisory committee for air quality conformity. Um, this is, is there a, a few uh, comments that have any information to add on it? Thank you, and I'll, and I'll be brief. Uh, as you all know, uh, this, this body adopted our, our 2045 long range transportation plan, uh, June of this year. This is intended to be a living document, and we will amend uh, the plan until it's replaced by the 2050. So recently, we received three uh, amendment requests. They are listed um, as part of 18I, um, and that's an additional movement at, at 64464, uh, Godwin Boulevard in Suffolk, and a St. Paul's Project Phase 2 in North. Um, these projects are all regionally significant. Fiscal constraint has been demonstrated. Um, we had a public comment review period. We did not receive any public comments, and your Transportation Technical Advisory Committee does recommend board approval. Uh, with the approval of these amendments, we will have to do another regional conformity assessment. Uh, so the action items are to approve the amendments, um, initiate conformity, and as part of that, we have a resolution that grants uh, the TTAC the authority um, to specifically approve the conformity project list as part of uh, transportation conformity. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you want to answer. So, Mr. Chairman, staff would recommend that um, the board take action to approve, approve the consent agenda items, including the action that was just outlined. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent items. Does it make it? So Second. Uh, discussion. All in favor, say the final say aye. 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 Opposed, say Motion carries. Identify the 19. Yes, we have our three-month uh, meeting schedule. Uh, as a reminder, we will meet in November. We take December off because HR TAC and in December, and then we'll be back in January and February. So. Um, in addition, we have the minutes of our HR TPO advisory committees. A couple of items of correspondence for your information, including EDOC's HR TAC uh, program development monthly report. Um, Sarah, it might be appropriate to call for any um, discussion of old or new business. I'm just going to Any uh, old business? Any new business? But that, I, I would just, I apologize, Sarah. I would just say that for those that uh, 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 have time for lunch, please, we have uh, Chick fil A for you today. Um, it's over behind our reception area, our new 757 room. Uh, so if you're staying for the next meeting, Starts at 12:30, but even if you're leaving, please pick up a lunch before you go. My apologies. And if you don't want lunch, I'll take.